from Matthew. I read this to you last week, chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Those were Jesus' words both to the disciples on several occasions, I might add, and also on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, they are words that I bring to you again this week as we proceed with the series Eye of the Storm. This is week two. We have four weeks that I'd like to walk with you through. And <clears throat> part of the beauty of the material, which is based on this book that I mentioned to you last week, and several of you purchased the book um, by Reverend Dr. Gary Simmons, who's been in the unity movement a long time. Um, this particular book's been around for a while, but I find it to be practically um, a good volume to have when it comes to learning how to not only recognize when we have conflict, but then recognize there's a gift in the conflict. It's presented itself for a reason. And if we can learn to find the gift, we can actually embrace conflict. And when we see it come up in our lives, say, oh yeah, rather than doing the fight or flight thing, I'm gonna stand in this and see what I can get from it, learn from it, and also bring to it that will help make my life and the world a better place. So we talked about how if you believe in one presence, one power, everywhere present, all good, that therefore you can work with the logic. Well, if that's the case, then no one is against me. How could anybody be against me if I believe in that particular principle, which as you know, all of you, this is our first principle, our first cause, is from that which we follow our other four precepts, especially one and two. Just for those of you that don't know this about the five principles, one and two are usually grouped together and then three, four, and five are the action steps in order to make one and two part of who we are, part of our DNA. And I always find that interesting because very often folks will gravitate toward one, maybe two of the principles, but don't understand that they build on each other and they're there for a reason. So there's a, a linear part to that. Also, as we walk through Eye of the Storm, you will see parts of the evolution of the principles come forth. You will see them come forth in yourself. You will see, oh, oh gosh, yeah, I, I am an expression of the divine, and here's how I can really make that happen in my life. So if we are going to talk about the review from last week just briefly, it was simply the fact that there is no one against you, and that experiences in your life you make mean something. And you're not just a victim of the experiences in your life. What you make those experiences mean is, is the difference between victim and victor. And so we're all very busy making meaning out of our experiences. And what happens very often is we allow the experience to have us as opposed to we have an experience in life. And this is how I'm going to walk through that experience. No, sometimes we wrap it all up into, oh gosh, that happened to me and that was just so awful. Did you know? Did you hear? Can I tell you about it? When you're doing that, you're automatically putting ourselves in the defense mode, in the explaining mode. There's no power in that mode. The powerlessness is palpable when we're in that mode because we have said to the experience, take over. I'm just going to talk about you all the time and what you experience did to me, not how I'm dealing with it. No, no. If we did that, then we would be very close to walking in authenticity with much of unity principle and a lot of what Gary says here in Eye of the Storm. Now, he uses a storm as his metaphor, if you will. When we have an eye of the storm, you know if you've been in a storm, there usually is, especially in a tornado or hurricane, there's an eye, there's a middle portion that's the calm. 
And the choice is here with I, as in the pronoun I, of the storm. We get to choose if we want to, when we're in conflict or challenge or temptation. Somebody came to me last week and said, would temptation be considered conflict? You betcha. And I don't know about you, but many of us find the word conflict defining and confining. So I'm going to ask you, whenever I say conflict, to also use the terms challenge, change, temptation. It kind of brings it a little closer to the heart and doesn't make it a little so rugged. When we hear conflict, some of us think we're going to war. No, conflict is really what conflict is, is what we call creative tension. And the universe is full of creative tension. If you don't think so, look at Mother Nature. Mother Nature is everything and anything but change. Creative tension, up, down, all around. So when we talk about the eye of the storm, we're talking about coming from our center, our wholeness. When life throws up challenges, when life throws up what life does, creative tension. That's never going to go away, folks. I have people who have said to me, I do not need this material. I'm not in conflict. I am a person of peace, so stop talking about the fact I may be in conflict. Okay, pack away the word conflict if it means that much to you and you can't get over conflict. We're in a process of change all the time in our lives. We're in a process of challenge. It does not go away. It is, my friends, the way of the world. So when you know that and you accept that, then one of the better ways, I think, of walking through this life journey is to do it with all the possible tools we can muster and one of these tools happens to be this concept this new paradigm of when you're in conflict you immediately go to your center you go to that part of you that is the god part of you the divinity of you and you know what it isn't a part of you it is you and do you see how very often we get into parts we are taught in even our culture to compartmentalize. Some of us are very pleased that we compartmentalize. When we talk about you and the real you and the real I, we are talking about the whole, the all, the perfection, the oneness. You know we use those terms in unity all the time. And yet we have this constant, um, I call it a self-argument about, well, which part of me do I like today? Or which part of me shall I throw out for the world to see today? How about you throw out the whole of you, the God of you? How about we stand in that? Talk about embracing and really looking for how we can work our way into a peaceful, loving existence all the time. And let me be clear on something here. I've taught this material for a long time, and here's, here's the truth of it for me. I like the material. It's incredibly helpful to me. It reminds me to go back to my center when I'm on that precipice, when I'm about to go in the abyss of parts of lower level consciousness, when I'm about to make a huge step in the wrong direction. I remember to go to my wholeness most of the time. When I don't remember to go to my wholeness, then I spend a, I spend a fair amount of time suffering as I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. If we don't consciously have a way of focusing ourselves on our wholeness, when we're standing right at the ready point of making a decision, we can either dive into the abyss or we can go and remember who we really are, children of God, whole and perfect, and step back from the abyss and stand tall in our truth. And the truth of all this for me is, I still will wander right up to that abyss and I'll look right in and you know what I'll even get the perfect dive stance ready to go. I am right and they are wrong. Watch me. What happens when I remember my wholeness, my oneness, is not only that I back away from the abyss, but I do it a whole lot faster these days than I used to. I do it so that I gracefully am able to move myself smoothly away from the abyss. It doesn't mean that I don't dive in the abyss from time to time. It doesn't mean that I don't really charge up and really keep looking over it. But when I use the tool of remembering I'm a child of God, I'm whole. I'm not parts. 
I'm all that is needed. I'm able to more quickly pull back from the abyss and feel like I have accomplished what I was sent here to do. Who have you come here to be? Have you come here to be um, the victim of your humanity? Or have you come here to be the child of God that you are? To demonstrate all the time your divinity. You see, that's the thing. We're to demonstrate the divinity all the time and do it first. The humanity will get in line. And that's not to deny our humanity. I'm not here to do that and neither is this material. The humanity is who we are. We should be very proud of our humanity if we're living authentically from our divinity. If we are living and doing and being from our humanity and taking the divinity along for a ride, mm -mm, betcha, you'll see that abyss come up again and again and again. The challenges will come up even more frequently. So what is it that we see? And this is also very helpful. What is it that is the tension, the resistance that comes? The resistance comes in four different winds, Gary calls them. They are the winds of separation is one, the wind of misperception, the wind of competition, and the wind of defensiveness. Meaning, when you start to feel any one of those breezes cross your heart or your mind, you are making up conflict and you are headed into the abyss. If, in fact, you don't recognize those four, they're telltale buttons for me. He calls them the winds because he likes this whole eye of the storm thing. I call them buttons, and as soon as I start to feel any kind of defensiveness or separation or competition, I, and then the other one, excuse me, is um, defensiveness. Oh yes, one of my very favorites. Um, I start to say to myself immediately, whoops, 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 whoops. I'm feeling that breeze and I'm going into resistance. And there are two types of resistance Gary talks about. One is inner and one is outer. And outer usually is a resistance that comes when we are physically either attacked, what both verbally can be, and that happens sometimes when we immediately, someone says something critical about us and we go, boom, wrong, ding, ding, ding. And we're immediately in that defensive mode. Inner resistance is a little more complicated. It's a feeling that we have and we know we don't like someone or something. What that is, is a gift, people. That's a gift, and some of you may say, yeah, to run the other way, get out of there. Don't want any part of that. No, you see, the reason that it's a gift is because it's coming up to let you know you are working on separating yourself from that individual and probably all of the ones around you. But more importantly, you're separating yourself from the parts. You are saying, I'm not going to see the gift in this. I won't see the blessing in it. Do you hear the word won't? I won't, or I can't, that's another one. Yes, you can, if you feel that you have power in your wholeness. If you understand that standing in that wholeness is where the power lives. And power is not control, people. Sometimes we like to think, if I'm powerful, I've got control. No, that is the least part of power. You see, part of why we think we have enemies Part of why we have resistance is because we don't feel safe. We have said to ourselves on some level, I'm not safe, I have to protect myself, I have to defend my belief, I have to decide this is mine and don't anybody ever tell me that it's not. When in fact you're in a state of non-resistance, you're open, you're willing to see, okay, maybe this isn't all it's cracked up to be. So this person is attacking me. Am I going to attack back? And I'll be honest with you, of course, that's part of who we are and how we've been trained to be. Attack, attack, attack. When really what we're doing when we attack is defend, defend, defend our little corner of the earth and how we're not feeling very safe today. And we're saying we're not whole. You see, when you say you're not safe, you're saying you're lacking something. 
And if you believe in your wholeness, in your oneness, one presence, one power, your own divinity, you are whole, folks. You are whole. There's no parts going on. So I'd like you this week to try and give up the parts of yourself. Try and really come from the wholeness of yourself when the change or the challenge or the transition flows in your life. And you can look for the signs. You can see when you start to separate, when you start to draw that line in the sand that says, you're wrong and I'm right. And then of course we put the icing on it with, you're wrong, I'm right, and I want you to know I'm right. <laughs> and if you can't tell that person directly, you find the first available pair of ears to sit down and say, do you know what they did? Let me tell you what they did. And we get ourselves so pumped up that in that pumpedness, we have separated. We have separated from the God of our being and the understanding that we are truly whole. Misperception is another little wind that blows. How often do we misperceive because we don't have all the facts, but we sure as shoot know what we saw and what we heard. Do we understand that each person that's in every seat here understands and sees differently than the next person? You might agree that the color palette is the same, but when you see purple, somebody else sees a different kind of purple, a violet, whatever. Misperception is a slippery slope. I know I saw it. Do you know that that person didn't show up on time? I was so insulted, we had this meeting set for weeks. And you go on down the road of being insulted as opposed to why was the person late? Was there something going on with them? Did they forget? And if they forgot, so what? So what if they forgot? But no, sometimes we really like to get into that whole misperception on the other guy's part. Because I showed up on time. Misperception, it really is a slippery slope. Competition, love that one. Competition, there are some people who wake up every single day and they are in a competitive mode, period. All day, all day long. That's how they are. They're, they compete with themselves mostly. And why do we compete? Because we think there's something missing. We think we have to hurry up and be better than the other guy. Competition is one of those four winds that starts to blow. And then defensiveness. And defensiveness is its also its own slippery slope. When we get defensive, when you feel yourself getting defensive, and we know, we know when we're getting defensive. You can feel it. You can feel it someplace in your body. You either sit up straight, grit your teeth, there's a part of that body that is saying, defense, defense. And when we're defensive, it is an absolute gift of God saying to you, wake up. This is something here for you to learn. There's a gift here. Maybe not in your mind a blessing, but there's something here for you to learn about the fact that you don't feel whole, that you don't feel as if you truly are a child of God, that you feel separate, that you feel alone, that you're in despair, that you have no one or nothing to go to. These are winds, are very, very clear winds, and we know when they're blowing internally. And so when we speak next week, we're going to talk about the attributes of wholeness. Just as you can see the winds come up, just as you can feel them, and there's four, we've named them. There are four attributes of wholeness that couple with these four winds of separation, misperception, competition, and defensiveness. When we have the four attributes of wholeness working for us, we can calm the winds the winds of separation, competition, defensiveness. We can calm them down with these four attributes. So that's what we'll talk about next week. Please keep in mind as we work through this series, this is very much practical how-to Christianity, which we in unity, you know, we, that's one of our tenets, that's our fifth principle. But this is all based on the teachings of Jesus and understanding who we are. It is also based on unity principles. You are divine expressions. You are unique expressions. So I look forward to being with you next week. 
I just want to say this as I leave this with you this week. Um, try. Give yourself the opportunity this week of really looking at when you get those buttons pushed and why they're getting pushed. <clears throat> Don't necessarily focus on who did the pushing because you know what, folks? The who is you.